Hola, buenas noches a todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos a esta sesión del Comité de Residentes. Eh, en esta ocasión con una invitación especial tanto a residentes, fellows y ortopedistas de México y Latinoamérica. El tema que vamos a tratar el día de hoy es inestabilidad eh, patelofemoral y eh, el doctor, a continuación el doctor Rivero nos va a dar eh, una bienvenida a esta sesión. Los dejo eh, con el doctor Rivero Bocher. A nombre del Colegio Mexicano de Ortopedia y del presidente, el doctor Jorge Negreta Corona, quiero darle la bienvenida a todos ustedes a la sesión del Comité de Reglamentaria del Comité de Residentes correspondiente al mes de mayo del año 2020. Quiero decirles que el Colegio Mexicano de Ortopedia continúa trabajando y continúa con sus planes de actualización y de enseñanza médica continua. Nosotros pensamos, según vaya la evolución, que vamos a continuar con nuestro congreso del 3 al 7 de noviembre, cuidando siempre todas las medidas sanitarias que para el caso vamos a tener. Esto se va a llevar a cabo en el World Trade Center de la Ciudad de México, y al cual están cordialmente invitados todos ustedes. Estamos adaptando... Vamos a poder ver nuestra biblioteca de sesiones reglamentarias, los webinars que estamos organizando y diferentes. Invitamos a subirse a nuestro manual digital de ortopedia, que está especialmente dirigido a los residentes, en donde van a encontrar eh, todas las orientaciones necesarias para su práctica y para su enseñanza diaria. Esto tiene la ventaja de que está disponible 24-7 que es un registro gratuito, gratuito, gratuito y hay contenidos referentes a la especialidad. Está estructurado como el POEM, como el programa para los residentes, por lo cual lo hace eh, definitivamente muy importante para ellos. Muchas gracias y continuamos con la sesión. Muchas gracias, doctor Rivero, por sus palabras y por la invitación. Antes de presentar a los panelistas, Quiero agradecer al doctor Alejandro Erce y al doctor Alfonso Migoya por la invitación a coordinar esta sesión. Y pues como pueden ver, el día de hoy tenemos profesores de lujo. Eh, voy a presentar a cada uno de ellos. En primer lugar, a la doctora Lori Hiemstra. Ella es profesora en la Universidad de Calgary, eh, directora de investigación en Banff Sports Medicine. También es eh, o forma parte del Grupo de Estudio Internacional Patelo Femoral. Lori, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know how busy you are, so it's a pleasure for all of us to have you. Quiero presentar eh, también al doctor Seth Sherman, eh, cirujano ortopedista, profesor también en Stanford eh, University Medical Center. Él también es miembro del Grupo Internacional de Estudio Patelo Femoral. Seth, también, eh, Seth, thank you so much as well for joining us. I know you are also busy, like Lori, and we really appreciate your time. Gracias, thanks for having me. También nos acompaña el doctor Luis Sierra, él es médico adscrito del Servicio de Artroscopía y Lesiones Deportivas en el Instituto Nacional de Rehabilitación y maestro de, de quienes ahí nos formamos. Doctor Sierra, muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos también. Gracias a ustedes, gracias a todos por estar aquí. Por último, el doctor Salvador Oscar Rivero Boschert, a quien ustedes ya escucharon, él es expresidente del CMO en el bienio del 2012 al 2013, y también médico adscrito al Hospital Médica Sur. Doctor Rivero, muchísimas gracias. Eh, es un placer contar con usted en esta sesión. Gracias y es un gusto acompañarlos a todos. Bienvenidos. Ok, pues vamos a iniciar con la 
primera presentación. Vamos a, a hablar sobre la evaluación clínica y por imagen en inestabilidad patelofemoral. Mi nombre es Jaime Palos, terminé uh -huh. eh, la alta especialidad en artroscopía y lesiones deportivas en febrero de este año. Y el objetivo tanto de la evaluación por imagen como clínica es siempre evaluar los factores de riesgo, tanto los anatómicos como los factores relacionados con los tejidos. Sabemos que los factores de riesgo pueden presentarse en distintas combinaciones, eh, incluso dos o más factores de riesgo presentes hasta en casi en el 60% de esta población. En cuanto a la evaluación clínica, siempre es importante interrogar sobre el primer episodio de luxación, en los casos agudos, valorar el grado de martrosis, ya en los casos crónicos, el signo de la J, la traslación de la patela, eh, problemas de alineación o de rotación, así como el grado de hiperlaxitud que pueden tener estos pacientes. Hay maniobras especiales que también podemos hacer, como la obtención patelar en movimiento, que tiene una sensibilidad del 100%, en la que trasladamos la patela de forma lateral y llevamos la rodilla de extensión a flexión y el paciente puede contraer el cuádriceps o de forma verbal mostrar la presión. Hay también eh, maniobras reversas con también una muy buena sensibilidad en la cual eh, llevamos la rodilla de flexión, extensión y aquí vamos a evaluar a los cuántos grados va a iniciar la insuficiencia de los estabilizadores de la patela. Eh, este estudio demográfico importante de Lori en el que subclasifica a estos pacientes en WARPS y state de acuerdo a distintas características. Por lo general, los pacientes que más vemos nosotros son tipo WARPS, que son mujeres con eventos de luxación tempranos, displasia grado, que utilicemos, en el cual valoramos de deportiva el riesgo de recurrencia, como en este score del doctor Valkerek, en el que evaluó a, a pacientes con luxaciones primarias, primarias tratados con manejo conservador, en seguimiento a, a dos años, son seis puntos los que evalúa la edad, la bilateralidad, el, el grado de displasia troclear, y pacientes que tenían cuatro puntos o más, tenían eh, hasta cinco veces más riesgo de presentar luxación. El otro score es el RIP score del grupo de la clínica Mayo, el doctor Mario Gebesi, en el que certificó a estos pacientes en riesgo bajo, moderado o alto, de acuerdo a, a cuatro factores, la edad, la inmadurez esquelética, la displasia troclear y la relación del TTTG con la longitud de la patela, por lo cual también es una buena forma de evaluar la recurrencia en estos pacientes. En cuanto a los estudios de imagen, como ya lo mencionaba, siempre es importante evaluar todos los factores de riesgo. Eh, la patela alta con el catón de Shams o el insal salvati. Podemos también evaluarlo en la resonancia magnética con el índice patelotroclear, en el cual vemos ese solapamiento del cartílago de la patela con el cartílago de la troclea. Y este es un ejemplo de un paciente de 13 años con más de 3 episodios en menos de 2 años, un catón de Shams de 1.7, un insal salvati de 2, y donde vemos que el índice patelo troclear pues, eh, ni siquiera va a tener ese solapamiento. Otra herramienta importante es el TTPG. Sabemos que más de 20 milímetros está asociado a inestabilidad, sin embargo no es una regla. Siempre hay que tratar de individualizar en estos pacientes y saber que las alteraciones rotacionales o el grado de displasia troclear puede llevar a una mala interpretación de esta medición. Lo normal es que tengamos de 10 a 13 milímetros en esta medición y los pacientes que tienen una verdadera lateralización son eh, quienes serán eh, mejores candidatos para osteotomía distal. Como podemos ver en, en estas imágenes, tanto la rotación de la rodilla como la displasia troclear de alto grado pueden alterar la medición y para eso tenemos otra herramienta como el TTPCL en el estudio de Seitinger evaluó eh, pacientes que tenían un TTTG aumentado no siempre tenían eh, ese aumento en la lateralización de la tuberosidad de la tibia, tomó como un valor de referencia 24 milímetros sin embargo podemos tener un punto de corte de 20 milímetros y como lo decía, es una buena alternativa en displasia troclear de alto grado, 
elimina la rotación femoral y nos habla de una verdadera lateralización de la tuberosidad eh, tibial. O un par de ejemplos más, esta es una paciente de 13 años con 5 episodios en menos de un año, atleta con un TTPG de 22 milímetros, un TTPCL de 18, y eh, donde podemos eh, posterior evaluar todos sus estudios de imagen, el problema principal no era esa lateralización, sino una displasia troclear de alto grado, un problema rotacional y secundario a esto, un aumento del, del pil patelar. Otro ejemplo más, un masculino de 31 años, con una primera luxación desde los 15 años, más de 10 episodios de luxación, un IMC de 32, el TTTG está aumentado, igual que el TTPCL, y en este eh, punto eh, quisiera recordar que es eh, mucho mejor tomar la medición del TTTG con la rodilla en extensión, porque la flexión puede infraestimar esta medición. Otro punto que hay que evaluar es la displasia troclear, que puede estar presente hasta en el 85% de estos pacientes, de acuerdo a Yur. Y eh, este es otro caso, una paciente de 16 años con más de 10 episodios de forma bilateral. Siempre en la radiografía, eh, una buena radiografía lateral, hay que evaluar todos los signos radiográficos de la clasificación de De Jure, medir el spur troclear y tener mucho cuidado con lo que evaluamos en, en la radiografía axial. Eh, por lo general, eh, mientras más flexión presente en la rodilla, vamos a ver eh, la troclea en cortes eh, más distales. Entonces, siempre es importante correlacionarlo, sobre todo con los cortes proximales y no fiarnos siempre eh, del, de lo que veamos en, el, en la radiografía axial. Otra herramienta para evaluar la displasia troclear es la inclinación del cóndilo femoral lateral con un punto de corte de 11 grados, con una muy buena sensibilidad del 93%. Y por último, eh, el patrón de contusión ósea y, la, y el patrón de ruptura del ligamento patelofemoral eh, medial. Este es otro caso de un paciente de 15 años, se encontraba jugando fútbol, tuvo un mecanismo de flexión y rotación externa, se vio en urgencias, eh, ingresó inicialmente con un, eh, una probable lesión del ligamento cruzado anterior. Aquí eh, recordar que no siempre el mecanismo de rotación de flexión y rotación externa va a ser igual a una ruptura del ligamento cruzado anterior. Eh, se tomaron radiografías en urgencias para ver si no tenía un fragmento osteocondral. Es importante saber que hasta el 45% pueden no ser detectables en la radiografía y decidimos tomar una resonancia magnética donde vimos el patrón de contusión ósea en el cóndilo femoral lateral, la faceta medial de la patela y la ruptura del ligamento patelofemoral medial. Eh, la ruptura a nivel de la patela eh, va a ser más frecuente en niños y adolescentes y a nivel de la inserción femoral en adultos jóvenes, en pacientes que tienen un TTPG aumentado y también la ruptura en este sitio va a tener mucho mayor eh, recurrencia. Como conclusiones, pues la exploración física eh, siempre hay que evaluar todos los factores de riesgo, factores anatómicos, los relacionados con los tejidos blandos hacer algún score para evaluar la recurrencia y platicar esto con los pacientes. Hay que ser minuciosos en la evaluación de la imagen y de nuestras mediciones, pero no olvidar siempre individualizar en todos nuestros pacientes. Eh, haciendo bien tanto la exploración como el buen análisis de la imagen, creo que nos va a llevar a una adecuada decisión de tratamiento para estos pacientes. Muchas gracias. Vamos a continuar con el doctor Luis Sierra, que nos va a hablar de la luxación aguda de patela. Doctor Luis Sierra, adelante. Gracias, Jaime. Vamos a compartir. Ok. Bueno, pues gracias por la invitación. Gracias a todos ustedes por estar aquí. Yo voy a hablarles un poquito más de eh, algunos tips y trucos que usamos en el tratamiento y en la evaluación de estos pacientes. Y esto es porque muchas veces nos encontramos con estas cosas, pacientes multioperados, patelas muy, malas, muy mal alineadas, muy malos resultados. Esto es algo que vemos muchísimo y esto es algo que me lleva 
a tocar algunos puntos que creo que les van a ser de mucha utilidad. La realidad es que después de una cirugía de patelo femoral, muchísimos pacientes se vuelven a luxar. No estamos viendo a futuro, los estamos tratando de resolver el problema muy rápido y con maniobras muy sencillas y a veces no logramos hacer lo que se tiene que hacer. La primera pregunta, después de una luxación, ¿qué hacer? Siempre nos preguntamos, ¿lo trato conservador o lo trato quirúrgico? Yo les diría, siempre traten conservador a un paciente, esperen a que se enfríen las rodillas, a menos y la indicación absoluta es que tengan lesiones osteocondrales. Ya lo eh, 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 dijo un poquito Jaime, cuando tengo lesiones osteocondrales o cuando tengo grandes abulsiones del ligamento patelofemoral, pues es una indicación absoluta para entrar y fijar el, el, el fragmento, entrar a reparar, y eso prácticamente es la única razón de entrar luego, luego. Si no, mejor lo inmovilizo, me detengo a estudiarlo y veo qué más le tengo que hacer. Y aquí voy con la primera regla y es entender de qué tamaño es el monstruo. Si yo no sé de qué tamaño es el monstruo, no le voy a resolver bien el problema. Y aquí yo creo que esta cosa que hizo Lori es muy, muy importante. ¿Quién se luxó? Esto es algo que tenemos que ver en todos nuestros pacientes. Tenemos que evaluar todo esto, tanto cuestiones físicas, cuestiones clínicas, la historia, las, eh, eh, todos los estudios de imagen que tenemos que tomar y tenemos que armar todo este rompecabezas para realmente ent entender qué piezas tiene. Esto ya lo comentó Jaime y aquí me parece un gran acierto que ya lo habíamos hecho para el hombro eh, los, los pacientes con tubs, con hambre y con IOS. Aquí lo que hicimos es simplemente es, eh, dividirlos en dos grupos. ¿Por qué? Porque así los puedo entender mejor. No es lo mismo este paciente que tiene una anatomía normal, y ya lo mencionó Jaime, que es fuerte, que tiene una eh, eh, anatomía, digamos, buena. Normalmente este tipo de alteraciones se ven en hombres, mayormente, en, en gente de mayor edad con ligamentos más rígidos, con un cuádriceps generalmente mucho más fuerte. Normalmente el mecanismo es de mucha más alta energía. La lesión es unilateral y la anatomía es normal. La trocla está formada, la patela está centrada, no tiene deformidades angulares o coronales y el TTTG es normal. Pero no siempre está así. Esto es lo que quiero hacerles ver. La gran mayoría de nuestros pacientes están así. Tienen todo mal o por lo menos gran parte de estas cosas están mal. Y tienen problemas óseos y tienen problemas en tejidos blandos y tienen problemas en la configuración de la troca y la patela. Y esto es algo que tenemos que voltear a ver. ¿Por qué es importante esto? Porque estos pacientes son mucho más fáciles que se nos vuelvan a luxar. Esta es la segunda clasificación, que es la WARPS. Normalmente mujeres, normalmente más chicas, normalmente tienen un proceso de hiperlaxitud mucho más importante. Su cuádriceps está más débil, tienen luxaciones de más baja energía. Generalmente son pacientes que ya se luxaron una patela y luego la otra o llevan varias luxaciones de las dos y están subluxadas, tienen displasia, está inclinada la patela, tienen deformidades angulares y coronales y el TTTTG. Es anormal. ¿Y por qué les digo esto? Porque la gran mayoría de los pacientes, por lo menos en México, generalmente nos llegan aquí. Y esto es algo intuitivo, estos no, no son números porque no tenemos estadísticas, pero yo les diría el 90% de los pacientes van a ser de este segundo tipo. Entonces, eh, ya lo mencionó también Jaime, ¿qué, ¿qué peso tiene cada pieza? Esto es probablemente lo más importante. ¿Qué riesgo tiene de volverse a luxar? No lo voy a volver a explicar porque ya lo dijo él, pero a mí me parece que es el saber este score de inestabilidad es muy bueno para yo saber si ese paciente tiene la posibilidad alta o baja en base a los factores de riesgo que me parecen factores que se toman en cuenta y que son adecuados para ver si ese paciente se puede volver a luxar o no. ¿Qué es lo bueno de esto? Que eh, puedo yo determinar si tiene menos de tres puntos y decir, este paciente no se me va a luxar tan fácilmente, y si tengo de 4 a 7, tiene una alta posibilidad de reluxarse. ¿Qué es lo padre de la correlación de estas dos cosas? Que normalmente cuando el paciente es un WARPS, va hacia 4 para arriba, y normalmente cuando es un STIDE, va de 2.5 o menos de 3 para abajo. Y esto es algo que me va a ayudar muchísimo. Entonces, si tengo una primera luxación con lesiones osteocondrales, o un índice de severidad de 4 puntos o más, si tengo una segunda luxación o llevo varias, entonces, ¿qué voy a hacer? Y aquí me voy a meter con el tratamiento. ¿Qué es lo que le vamos a hacer? Y esto a veces es 
una cascada de ideas de no saber por dónde empezar. Y aquí yo lo siguiente que les diría es hay que seguir la regla del iceberg. Y esto es una de las cosas más importantes que yo siempre les digo a mis residentes. Tendemos a querer resolver todo con los tejidos blandos. Y muchas veces no nos damos cuenta que debajo de todo esto hay una deformidad o sea muy importante. Y si nosotros nos vamos sobre tejidos blandos, no le resolvemos al paciente, se vuelven a elongar los tejidos y el paciente se vuelve a luxar. Hay cuatro cosas o cuatro tipos de tratamiento que tenemos que cuidar. Primero, el A es, ¿tiene alineación buena axial o coronal? Sí o no. Y esto es a lo primero que tenemos que voltear. Si yo tengo problemas a este nivel de la alineación del fémur con la tibia, de la posición de la tuberosidad anterior de la tibia, y esto ya más o menos saben ustedes cómo, cómo medirlo, ya lo dijo Jaime también, el TTTG, la verdad es que mucha gente no lo toma, yo lo he visto, no lo tomamos, nadie lo sabe tomar, nadie se ha ido con sus radiólogos a decirle, mídeme esto, o el, TT, el, TTG, el TTPCL también es una buena maniobra para determinar más de 20 milímetros, esto me dice que esto es anormal y que tengo normalmente que hacer correcciones. ¿Qué hacemos en este sentido? Para mí, la tuberosidad anterior de la tibia es un elemento que me ayuda muchísimo para corregir estas cosas, incluso deformidades angulares o rotacionales. Yo puedo adelantar la patela, yo puedo eh, medializarla, yo puedo bajarla incluso si lo necesito y es una cirugía para mí eh, muy, con, con muy buenos resultados en muchos casos. Seth les va a hablar un poquito más sobre las indicaciones precisas de todo esto. Es, realmente no es un procedimiento eh, muy complicado. Se puede hacer con dos tornillos. Si yo dejo íntegro el periósteo distal, puedo hacerlo con un solo tornillo y es un procedimiento que funciona bastante bien. Eh, osteotomías balizantes, osteotomías desrotadoras a veces están indicadas. Yo la verdad es que balizantes he hecho un par. No es algo que normalmente, a menos que sea su deformidad principal. Desrotadoras no he tenido la oportunidad de hacerlas, no he tenido pacientes con una gravedad como estas que en, la, en las que la, en la deformidad sea principal y que haya que hacerlo, pero está indicado y hay que pensar en ello. Eh, la B es las estructuras y los tejidos blandos. ¿Cómo están las estructuras laterales? ¿Cómo están las mediales? ¿Y cómo está el cuádriceps? Esto es bien importante y también les voy a decir por qué. Porque normalmente nosotros tendemos a querer arreglar todo, como les decía por aquí. ¿Qué pasa con esto? Primero, y se llama realineación proximal. ¿Qué pasa con la liberación del retináculo lateral? Que es algo que todo mundo le hace a, los, a las rodillas. Le libero el retináculo en... Eh, inestabilidad rara vez está indicada. Es como tener un zapato flojo y además aflojarle las agujetas. No tiene ningún sentido. ¿Cuándo está indicada? Cuando está apretado. Hay que tener muchísimo cuidado. La liberación retinacular lateral puede tener muchísimas complicaciones. Cuando está tenso el retináculo lateral, en realinaciones mixtas, sí. En los pacientes guards sí se necesita muchas veces cuando tengo una mala alineación grave para llevarla a su lugar. Entonces, hay que tener cuidado con la liberación. La aplicatura medial tiene sus indicaciones. Aunque yo uso mucho las aplicaturas artroscópicas para problemas de dolor patelofemoral, sí creo, a diferencia de lo que dice Jeffrey Albrecht, yo sí creo que hay que hacer aplicaturas más fuertes. Creo que hay que duplicar el tejido, como ustedes se los enseño aquí, porque de esa manera puedo tener un poquito más de contención. ¿sí? Los avances eh, del, del vasto medial rara vez los estoy haciendo. Ya creo que es algo que no tiene tanta eh, indicación en nuestros días. Y la otra es el ligamento patelofemoral medial. Fíjense ustedes, el ligamento patelofemoral medial también creo que estamos abusando de él. ¿En quién está indicado? En pacientes con STAID, con una deformidad muy chiquita. Yo le puedo resolver muy bien con un ligamento patelofemoral. Y aquí entra esta regla que también les digo que es la, la regla de la correa del perro. El ligamento patelofemoral es una correa del perro y está ahí y es un post del fémur. De manera que si la patela se va a luxar, entonces el ligamento patelofemoral entra al quite. Yo no estoy jalando al perro como si quisiera llevarlo a su lugar. Si yo tengo que jalar con el ligamento patelofemoral medial a la patela, esto no está bien porque si yo eh, cambio su, su, mala, su, su posición, la posición de la inserción, o cambio simplemente un, en una patela muy mal alineada, entonces yo no voy a tener un buen resultado y voy a generar rigidez. Y finalmente hay muchas técnicas, yo utilizo más con anclas, simplemente nunca dejarlo tenso. La siguiente, y ya me voy a ir muy rapidito, es la altura patelar. 
hay maniobras para hacer esto, hay que ver si está alta la patela, puedo distalizar la, la tuberosidad anterior de la tibia, eh, simplemente desinsertándola y bajándola, también se puede hacer expensas de tejidos blandos, y finalmente, eh, en cuestión de la troclea y la patela, pues un, se puede cambiar la configuración patelofemoral medial, está indicada, nos va a platicar un poquito más el doctor Rivero cómo se hace esto. Creo que todavía le falta estudio, creo que todavía no tenemos la capacidad de poder adaptar la anatomía troclear a la patela. Eh, a mí me hace mucho más sentido hacer eh, un, quitar un fragmento de la parte lateral del cóndilo femoral medial, hacer un ascenso de la faceta lateral y ponerlo en su lugar. Entonces, estos, como ven, son todas las eh, opciones que tenemos. Y finalmente, para... Para concluir con esto, es, lo que quiero hacerles ver es que tenemos que ver de qué tamaño es el paciente y qué componentes de estos tiene. A veces la decisión se lleva mucho más adentro, ya que hice la artroscopía. Me voy a adelantar por cuestiones de tiempo, les ofrezco una disculpa. Y eh, cierro con esto. ¿Qué es lo que hay que hacer en problemas de patelo femoral? Es simplemente entender que los pacientes no, no son negros o blancos, son en una escala de grises van de un negro a un blanco y yo tengo que entender exactamente dónde está este paciente para poderle dar un buen resultado que le sirva muchos años. Muchísimas gracias por su atención. Muchas gracias, doctor Luis Sierra. Sin duda, bastante interesante esta propuesta del ABCD en inestabilidad patelofemoral. Vamos a continuar con la doctora Lori Hiemstra. Lori. confusing. So Dr. Paolo taught us about all the different uh, radiologic measurements we can do, and there's many, many of them. Dr. Sierra talked about all the different operations, and I love the puzzle piece with all the different uh, predisposing factors for patellar instability. So they left it to me to tell you what to do with that patient when you're actually in the examination room and you want to, you actually have to decide what to do with that patient. So thank you for the easy job. I'll make this screen big. There we go. So. In general, if you look at all the patients that will present your office with patella femoral instability, if we take away all those congenital ones and the permanent dislocations and the, the outside the box crazy ones, the majority of people are normal humans that play sports and want to be active. And if you look at those patients, most of those will do okay with an MPFL reconstruction. So the vast majority of the patients that will come into your office will do fine with an MPFL reconstruction. So how do you decide uh, which patients need more than just an isolated MPFL? And then if you think they need more than that, how do you decide what operation to do? So I have a very simple algorithm. I'm a bit of a science girl and a research girl and I like numbers and I like things in front like most orthopedic surgeons. So you heard described all the predisposing risk factors, but Some of them are more common than others, and many of the ones that have to do with the bony anatomy probably contribute more to instability than some of the softer ones. So what I do and what I teach my residents and fellows to do, when we see a patient with patellar instability, we take our history, yes, but when we look at the physical exam and their imaging, we take a look at, uh, we do all the measurements. So all those different things you saw described, the dysplasia, We're going to take a look at that imaging, look at the grade of this dysplasia and the size of the trochlear bump. We want to know if there's any patella alta, and you can pick which measurement you use. I use a caton des champs. We want to look if that tubercle is lateralized, and then we want to look if there is any rotation of the femur and the tibia, and if there's patellar tilt. And these measurements will encompass most of the issues you will see with patellar instability. And we're going to combine those with a few other things, but these are the ones we can measure. So some of this has been gone through before. I think trochlear dysplasia is probably the biggest one. I always insist on a true lateral view, and I get most of my information on a true lateral view. 
If it is rotated, it doesn't tell you very much, so you must have a good x-ray. And it can tell you if there's trochlear dysplasia, and you can also measure the size of the bump, and I'll go over that quickly. And then I always get axial imaging, either a CT or an MRI, so I can see the shape of that trochlea. So if you see here, the yellow line, that's the base of the trochlear groove. The blue line is the medial condyle, the pink line is the lateral condyle. So this is a patient with really no crossover sign and no dysplasia. Here's a patient where the base of the trochlear groove and the medial condyle will overlap. So they crisscross right here, and that's at the anterior border of the femur. So there is your crossing sign right here, and this patient has low-grade dysplasia. If you see now, here's an example of a patient with high-grade dysplasia, anterior border of the femur. You can see the base of the trochlear groove, the yellow line, and you can see where the medial condyle overlaps. There's your crossing sign, and you can see how far in front of the anterior border of the femur that is. So this space right here is actually your trochlear bump. That's actually a three-dimensional thing, but we're looking at it in two dimensions. So this is the information I get on a uh, lateral x-ray. So if you determine your patient has trochlear dysplasia, now you have to, the treatment for trochlear dysplasia, if you're going to treat it, would be a trochleoplasty. So the most common one would be a groove deepening trochleoplasty. So I consider that in patients who have recurrent instability, they have high grade dysplasia, for sure the type Ds, sometimes the type B, du jour type B, that have a large trochlear bump. And often these patients have quite a significant J sign. The patella really pops over laterally when they extend. And I do do trochleoplasties primarily. I think if you know the patient needs one, you want to do the right operation the first time. But often I consider it secondary after a failed MPFL. You must have closed growth plates, so this is not appropriate in a child. And I always combine it with a soft tissue stabilization, so that would be with an MPFL reconstruction. So that's trochlear dysplasia. TTTG distance, everybody knows what this is and it's been described. Again, we measure that. My issue with the TTTG distance is that when you measure it, what does it tell you? Where is that abnormality? So the tubercle is down here. The trochlear groove is up higher on the femur. So really, if the TTTG number, the distance, is abnormal, it's just telling us there's something wrong between these two yellow lines. It doesn't tell us where it is. So just because the TTTG distance is increased doesn't necessarily mean the patient needs a tubercle osteotomy. It could be um, because they're, they have trochlear dysplasia and their trochlear groove is medialized. It could be because their femur is antiverted. It could be because their tibia is externally rotated. Or it could be the typical reason why their tubercle is lateralized. So I like to try to sort out which one of those things is causing the increase in TTTG. So I use that number as a red flag and it triggers me to just think a little bit more about where the deformity is. So the TTPCL distance, I also measure in every single patient. I know if there's a problem in that sagittal plane and the TTPCL distance can tell me if it's because the tubercle is lateralized. Patella alta, we all know the measurements and there's already been nice slides showing patella femoral engagement. There's a lot of new papers out just recently looking at what should be our threshold for addressing patella alta. And the reality is, is we probably really don't know. Abnormal has been called 1.2 or greater. So if I measure a caton des champs of 1.2 or greater, I at least, it triggers me to think about whether or not I should distalize the tubercle. I don't necessarily do it in everybody, but it triggers me to think about it. So I'll take into consideration the patellofemoral engagement. I'll take into consideration whether the patient has a high Baten score and they're loosey-goosey, or whether it's combined with trochlear dysplasia. So all these numbers just trigger me to think about it. The assessment of rotational abnormalities is difficult. I usually look for it the most on my physical exam. So you might see this patient when you get them to stand or walk and you think, oh, they, they look varus. But actually, she's not varus. She's hyperextending her knees there. If I ask her to stand with her knees straight or just at zero degrees of flexion, so knees straight, you can see that her femurs are actually rotated or her tibia is externally rotated. If I ask her to point her feet out so her patella are pointing forward, you can see her rotation abnormality. So this patient clearly does not have varus, they have a rotation problem. 
So again, the numbers for what rotation is abnormal varies and nobody really knows. I do a clinical exam in the supine position. If their hip external rotation is greater than 70 degrees, and if their external rotation is 30 degrees greater than their internal rotation, I call that abnormal from a clinical perspective. In general, we tend not to address version problems in a primary procedure. It's very hard to convince a patient whose patella has dislocated three times that you need to cut their femur and rotate it and reattach it. So I tend to use my derotation osteotomies in the revision situation. But at least this clinical exam will trigger me that something is abnormal. And if you want to know more, I order a rotation profile, which can be in a CT or an MRI. And same with tibial external rotation. I think we know even less about that. Um, but if we note clinically that there's the uh, foot thigh angle is increased, I note it and I put it down as one of the uh, pathoanatomic risk factors. And I have done a few derotation osteotomies of the femur. Again, axial imaging will let you measure uh, that number. So I'm a numbers girl. You see, I like numbers. So again, we've made, we know what our risk factors are. We're going to make all those measurements. And in my chart, you will see numbers for each one of these. So I write down all the numbers and then I take a look at what's abnormal. So if, so if, the display, if they have dysplasia, I try to decide which of these abnormal numbers is contributing the most to their instability. Then I look at the patient. So we want to take into consideration how bad their symptoms are. We want to know how much their demand is. Are they a soccer player or do they just want to walk to school and home again? We want to take into account a little bit the patient's psychological profile. Are they up for a big, huge operation? Will they be able to tolerate it? Um, I look, I put a lot of stock in the J sign. So if that lateral pull is so significant that their patella pops laterally, just putting a soft tissue reconstruction in there is not going to hold that in place. I think that was your dog and your leash pulling, wasn't it? So the, uh, we can't just put soft tissue if there's big lateral pull. So I take a, and then finally I take a, um, a look at their Baton score because I think patients that are loosey goosey are at higher risk for everything. So I look at all these numbers, I decide which are contributing the most, and then I see what's my tolerance for what I will do to this patient. So if everything is abnormal, I'm not going to do a trochleoplasty, uh, tibial tuberculostomy, MPFL reconstruction, a derotation osteotomy. That's crazy. Like No one would do that much surgery. So you have to decide where the biggest bang for your buck is. I don't know how you translate that into Spanish, but where the most money is, where you can get the highest value for the operation you do for somebody. And then my other principle is always fix at the site of the deformity. So for all your studying of drawer paley and deformity orthopedics, his mantra is fix at the site of the deformity. And this is why I kind of get all riled up when people say the TTDG is high, therefore we do a tubercle osteotomy, because that may not be where the site of the deformity is. I might sometimes do it because I'm just not willing to do a different operation or the patient has arthritis and it's not appropriate to do a trophyoplasty, but at least I always try to fix at the site of the deformity. And if I'm not doing that, I know I'm not doing that or doing that intentionally. And then the final thing that hasn't been covered too much yet is um, the tilt. So I think exactly like was said, we don't wanna pull the patella into the groove. So I always assess tilt. Uh, I do look at the axial imaging and a tilt greater than 20 degrees, again, is my red flag to trigger me uh, to consider that tilt, but really it's the clinical evaluation. In a reduced patella, reduced in the groove, can you um, untilt them to neutral? And I'm fairly liberal now at doing a lateral retinacular lengthening. I release only if I can't do a lengthening or I'm just not willing to make another incision on them, but for the most part, I'll do a lengthening to untilt that patella, let it sit nicely in the groove, and then put it in a PFL. So make all your measurements, figure out what's abnormal, figure out which ones you want to correct, and then fix at the site of the deformity. So just a really quick case, I want to show you a good example. This was a 16-year-old girl with um, lateral patellar instability, minimal alta, slightly elevated TTTG, but a normal TTPCL. Uh, she had quite significant tilt and high-grade dysplasia with a big J sign. This was before I did trochlearplasties. 
And so I did what probably most people do in this situation. I did a TTO and an MPFL, and she did terrible. She certainly was better postoperatively than pre-op, but she really wasn't that happy and still had some J sign. So when she came back to me for her other knee, we took a better look at her uh, risky anatomy, and we uh, felt that the dysplasia was probably the one thing contributing to her J sign rather than that TTTG, and probably causing her TTTG to be slightly elevated. So on her second knee, we did a trochleoplasty MPFL reconstruction, and she did great. And here's just a J. Oops. Oh, there. Did I lose you? There. Could you see that? I disappeared from you. Yes, we can see it and we hear you, Dr. Laurie. Okay, sorry. You guys disappeared for a sec. Yeah, so you can see on the one main. She still has a rigid residual J sign. On the knee with the trochleoplasty, no J sign, and much better postoperatively. And in the second knee, we could change and, and do that. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lori. It's a very nice case and also a very nice algorithm. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions about it. But let's move forward with uh, Dr. Seth Sherman. Seth? Hi there, can you guys see my screen? And you guys go ahead. And you can hear me, excellent. So yes, we do. Yeah. Fantastic, uh, really appreciate the invitation. Uh, this has been an outstanding uh, series of uh, talks. I puedo hablar un poco español, pero no puedo entender when you talk very fast. So I hope that uh, um, I understood the first two lectures, but uh, I'm excited to have some good discussion. Um, let me move my slide forward. It's not advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, just want to thank my mentors in uh, patel femoral and cartilage restoration. Uh, you may recognize some of these uh, gentlemen. They've been down to Mexico and uh, South uh, and Latin America. Uh, John Fulkerson, Brian Cole, Jack Farr, Andreas Gamal, Christian Latterman. Um, uh, Bill Bugby and Burt Mandelbaum, amongst many others, uh, who uh, have really uh, paved uh, the way uh, for me in the way that I think about this um, in the Patel femoral world. Um, just to show you, I did the AOSSM SLARD uh, tour, uh, the No Sleeping Fellowship tour, as Moises Cohen uh, would tell us in 2017. So I have a real special place in my heart uh, for Latin America. Uh, this is uh, us catching a uh, sabado in uh, Isla Hobosh, so I can't wait to come back uh, and do this in person, hopefully, uh, for an extended period in the future. Uh, the age-old question is, what's the best way to treat patellofemoral problems? And uh, that's why we're all here tonight. Uh, and most of the time in America, people try to refer to someone else. Um, uh, you know, this has become a very hot topic, and uh, we have become the someone else. Uh, the more you do patellofemoral, the more you do it, and uh, it really uh, becomes an addiction, and the patients will come to you if you set up your practice and take care of uh, these patients, and you can get good outcomes. Stick to principles the way the other speakers, uh, and I will hopefully uh, share tips and pearls. Um, I think some big differentiating points that we all are hitting on is that we need to treat the joint as a whole, as an organ. We need to think about alignment, stability, and some of the things I'll talk about with tubercle osteotomy is how to treat or unload the cartilage or chondral surfaces. Uh, the things that with a tibial tubercle osteotomy, we can correct malalignment, instability, chondrosis or cartilage problems, or what we'll focus on here is combination problems. Uh, this was a infographic that I did recently with uh, Jack Farr, and it summarizes many of the concepts that I will hit on over the next few minutes. Uh, we developed a biomechanics model at the University of Missouri before I went to Stanford. We were able to see what normal contact areas and pressures look like. We were able to manipulate this model so we could change variables such as TTTG, 
greater than 20. And we can see what happens to the forces on the cartilage. I think as you get this lateralized vector, the force goes up on the distal lateral cartilage surfaces. We've heard about the effects for TTTG on instability. Now we can think a little bit about the cartilage surfaces. We also know that a Fulkerson takes load off of that distal and lateral patella and normalizes it. When we do uh, tibial tubercles, we're talking either medial flat cut, like an Elmsley triat, or different variations of anterization and medialization, as you see here. The steeper the slope, the more unloading of the cartilage, whereas a medialization can be done purely to correct those abnormal values that were so nice. Alta, we've learned about why it's important for instability, um, but it's also important for cartilage. You can see that when you have patella alta, the distal cartilage is overloaded. And when you correct patella alta, it normalizes those forces. So I think this is the background by which we can kind of evaluate what procedure to do and when. So just to make this hopefully easier, what are my indications for teaching and patella instability? I would say that an isolated means for instability alone is very rare in my practice these days, and I think that's supported um, by the literature or lack of literature. TTTG greater than 20 is not equal to a TTO. We need to think more broadly, use the tools speakers have talked about so eloquently uh, to help us. However, when we combine anterization and medialization, a Fulkerson, we use that fairly often, mostly to unload cartilage lesions. And then another way I use it is when I have combined distalization and medialization uh, for severe patella alta and also a lateralized force vector. Noting that when you distalize, there also is some medialization inherently built into the system. And this is a paper that Bill Post and Don Fithian uh, put out uh, shortly uh, uh, before that really shows again that there's no evidence just to indicate isolated medialization and certainly not just on TTTG alone. There is, however, support for an anteromedialization, particularly if there's lateral overload with arthrosis or chondrosis. However, I do still have some times that we can discuss where I do consider this medialization. Clearly, I'll need abnormal values, TTTG greater than 20, TTTG greater than 24. I also measure them every time. I think about a patient who's young, bilateral instability, low energy dislocation. They may have a subtle or a real J sign. They may have those other types of trochlear dysplasia, the A or C, uh, that may not be perfect candidate for a trochleoplasty, and these borderline values of Alta, so not greater than 1.4, but a combination of risk factors. And maybe they failed prior surgery, like this girl who had low energy, recurrent bilateral dislocation starting at age 12. She had a J sign. She has these abnormal values, as you see here. Um, and she failed prior soft tissue surgery. She will not do well without a bony procedure in combination with her soft tissue procedure. So for me, she actually did well with a medialization and a soft tissue stabilization. You can see her opposite side, she still has subluxation and tilt, and we plan for a future bony and soft I think it's interesting how I continue to evolve on this as Lori did, uh, do we move the, the uh, tubercle you know, to center the patella, or do we start thinking about moving this medialized groove lateral? And so I think that we're continuing to figure this out over time. For chondrosis, we've seen from John Fulkerson the correlation between location of cartilage defects and outcome. We've seen the effects of an isolated anterior medialization and how powerful this can be. And so here's kind of what this looks like. If you have a distal lateral defect, we can do an AMZ plus soft tissue stabilization, and we don't even need to uh, do anything to the cartilage surface. However, if you have these large medial or pan patella defects, we need to combine the osteotomy also with cartilage restoration to get excellent results. So here's a 16-year-old, recurrent patella dislocations, painful effusions between those episodes, and so there's a large cartilage defect medial, 
there's a lateralized force vector, so a high TTTG. You may worry if you do the osteotomy that you load the medial lesion, but I would say you combine that with the cartilage restoration and with soft tissue balancing to get yourself a good result. When to add distalization is controversial. If you go purely by isometry of the MPFL, you might say a Catan de Champ of 1.2. However, some clinical studies are saying that we probably should not indicate these with a Catan between 1.2 and 1.4. And frankly, uh, outcomes have been quite good up to 1.4. And so I think for me, I've been steered in doing these a little less frequently. However, when you have a patient like this with bilateral instability and severe patella alta, Personally, I cannot fix this problem without including distalization along with my soft tissue stabilization to get the job done. Just a few pearls, we cannot use the MPFL to pull the patella. We need to complete the osteotomy first and then add soft tissue stabilization as that check rein to lateral translation or as that leash so nicely alluded to. For doing osteotomy plus cartilage, it's a little different. We can unhinge osteotomy, and before we fix it, we can actually enter the joint much more easily. Then we will fixate the tibial tubercle and the soft tissue after we do the cartilage restoration. Uh, just to show what we presented at AOSSM, looking at these indications that I described in different series of patients with and without TTO, and we can get good to excellent outcomes uh, if we choose the patients properly, and the complication rates are low or similar between both groups. However, it does take longer, as would be expected, to get to the highest levels of activity when you combine tibial tubercle osteotomy. Complications are important. When you lose the hinge distally, there's a higher rate of delayed union, uh, and when you use smaller screws, there's less pain and less reduction of hardware. When you have that complete detachment again, there's higher risk of complication. These are unflattering pictures of mine uh, that have happened and can happen to you. So I would be careful in your technique for distalization. Uh, when we do just a medialization or an anteromedialization, the risk of this is way lower than a distalization using standard techniques. Which leads me to my final slides, which is uh, showing future directions. Uh, this is Al Merchant, uh, who is a wonderful thought leader in patellofemoral. He created a different type of tibial tubercle osteotomy, um, which uh, you can see the cuts are inside the cortices. Uh, they are not um, uh, uh, the similar cut as a uh, classic Fulkerson. Uh, and you can see, you can use bone graft um, uh, to secure this as needed. Uh, but his system has allowed for three plane correction. You can really dial in precisely anterization, medialization, distalization, or combinations uh, of these factors. Uh, and so it's been quite useful uh, for me. Uh, I think in the interest of uh, time, uh, we can end it there and go to discussion. Um, but I do have videos of this technique. And uh, if the uh, collaborators would like to share uh, my contact information with you, I'm happy uh, to show those uh, to you. Because I think this and other evolutions of osteotomy techniques uh, are quite uh, exciting. Um, so to close, I think that uh, TTO is a powerful tool to correct malalignment in the setting of instability and or chondrosis. These indications and techniques are evolving very rapidly. I think if we choose patients well, we do the surgery um, with good execution and we adhere to appropriate rehabilitation, then we have an opportunity for an optimal outcome. And I thank you very much for your attention. I will give these slides uh, to the leaders so that they have them. Uh, there are references of ours uh, that you can uh, dive deeper into this topic. Uh, and muchas uh, gracias uh, para todos. Thank you so much, Seth, for your talk. Very nice. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Vamos a continuar eh, con el doctor Rivero Bocher. Sí. Gracias. Hemos visto unas pláticas realmente impresionantes así de cómo visualizar este problema de la inestabilidad patelofemoral. Y a mí me corresponde hablar eh, en concreto nada más acerca 
de la tropiloplastía, probablemente de las indicaciones y de algunas de las técnicas. La exploración física, como se ha puntualizado todo, en todo el webinar, es importante y la alineación en el plano coronal y el perfil rotacional de los pacientes es muy importante, lo que nos va indicando y nos, lo que nos va precisando la necesidad de hacer procedimientos óseos para tratar la inestabilidad patelar. La exploración física es eh, de suma importancia para poder conocer exactamente cuáles son los signos clínicos de la inestabilidad de la paciente y cuando estamos pensando en una displasia, generalmente vamos a encontrar problemas de aprensión, desplazamiento lateral a más de 45 o 60 grados y el signo de la J que como nos explicaba Lori, eh, puede ser corregido con la trocloplastía. La evaluación radiológica se ha profundizado mucho en ella. Presentación en pantalla, Chava. ¿Mandé? Presentación en pantalla completa. Ay, sí, es cierto. La exploración radiológica eh, es importante para poder evaluar tanto el centraje de la rótula como eh, la altura de la rótula, que es importantísima, factor condicionante para la presentación de la displasia. Y las radiografías axiales nos van a dar exactamente la forma de la trocla femoral y nos va a poder hablar acerca de las indicaciones precisas de realizar una trocloplastía. También en una tomografía, en los cortes axiales, nos podemos fijar precisamente en las características de la rótula, de la troclea y en la profundidad de la troclea y tanto las medidas del cóndilo medial como la altura del cóndilo lateral y las distancias del centro de la troclea hacia el borde lateral del de fémur. Y eso es importante para tomar en cuenta en el momento de las decisiones quirúrgicas. También nos van a determinar las angulaciones y la profundidad del surco, lo cual es que un, una característica importante para la indicación de realizar eh, este tipo de cirugía, la trocloplastía. A mayor altura de la rótula, mayor displace en el surco y esto se debe precisamente a un origen embrionario. Si desde el embrión la rótula se presenta alta, no existe el estímulo mecánico para la formación de la troclea con los movimientos de flexo-extensión. Y esto es determinado genéticamente, ya que la rótula y la presencia de la compresión de la rótula va generando estímulos mecánicos para la formación de la profundidad de la troclea, ya sea desde la etapa embrionaria hasta como eh, durante la infancia. Y generalmente hay una combinación de estos factores. La correlación entre la inclinación patelar y la distancia TTE-TTG también es muy importante. Ya habíamos visto o vimos en las pláticas anteriores cómo tomar las decisiones acerca de qué procedimientos hacer y qué no hacer. Se habló también y hablamos, profundizamos un poco sobre la clasificación de Ayur de la displasia troclear. La displasia tipo A, en donde eh, la profundidad de la troclea es mayor a 145 grados, pero existe todavía troclea y probablemente la inestabilidad se deba más bien a problemas de partes blandas más que a problemas de partes óseos. Pero a partir del tipo B, donde eh, ya la troclea femoral es plana y empieza a existir un espolón supratroclear, ya hay signo del cruce positivo y tenemos una troclea plana, ya podemos hablar de una inestabilidad de origen óseo. No se diga más que en la C, en donde ya existe una prominencia importante de la parte lateral de la troclea y hay una displasia medial importante. Y en la tipo D, en donde existamente existe hasta un tope, hasta el signo de eh, una caída importante de la troclea, que nos está determinando una deformidad importante. La indicación de una trocloplastía es una inclinación lateral o negativa de la troclea con inestabilidad con una displasia severa del surco y generalmente se hace en forma combinada, como lo veíamos en pláticas anteriores, aunque en algunas ocasiones puede ser una cirugía que se realiza solo, pero generalmente se asocia a otros procedimientos óseos como la osteotomía de la tuberosidad o como plastías del ligamento patelofemoral medial. La técnica realmente desde el punto de vista que quirúrgico es realmente artesanal, incluye hacer una profundización del surco, primero hacer un corte coronal subcondral 
de más o menos de 5 milímetros que nos permita el moldeamiento de este fragmento osteocondral y después hacer con una fresa o con un osteotomo una profundización de un corte en B, aquí como se ve en el diagrama, moldeando el fragmento. Antiguamente, y la técnica original de De Jure, se utilizaba una fijación con grapas y ahora se está utilizando otro tipo de fijación. ¿Cómo calcula uno el corte? ¿Dónde deben ser los cortes? La técnica original de De Jure eh, habla de un abordaje medial, subvasto, para una exposición adecuada de la, de, de la troclea, haciendo una luxación lateral de la patela y exponiéndola adecuadamente. Y se marca la articulación haciendo una línea proximal desde el surco, más o menos con unos 3 o 6 grados de inclinación lateral, y después delimitar las líneas lateral y medial eh, proximales al surco códilo troclear de los dos lados para no interferir con la articulación femoropatelar. De ahí, en los rebordes, de, se hace una osteotomía periférica con cincel en todos los rebordes osteocartilaginosos, dejando un espesor aproximadamente de 5 milímetros para poder moldear este fragmento que vamos a desprender y de, a, debajo de él hacer una profundización en un ángulo de 15 a 20 grados para tratar de tener un ángulo normal de una troclea normal. Generalmente hay que resecar de 8 a 10 milímetros de profundidad en el corte y moldear manualmente el fragmento osteopartilaginoso para que vuelva a tomar la forma de la troclea. Les decía que originalmente De Jure describe la fijación con unas grapas, eh, en que unas están en el fragmento secondral y el otro pie de la grapa está en la parte anterior de la, eh, de la corteza femoral. Sin embargo, hoy en día la mejor forma de fijación es mediante anclas óseas y mediante suturas reabsorbibles. Se pueden usar, eh, de aquí en este dibujo tenemos cuatro o cinco anclas, en donde se pone la original o la ancla inicial exactamente en el surco intercondilio y de ahí se lanzan dos, tres cuerdas hacia el centro, primero hacia el centro de la troclea y luego hacia la parte medial y hacia la parte lateral para poder hacer eh, una adecuada compresión de los fragmentos óseos que estamos delimitando. Para que tengamos una cirugía exitosa, necesitamos tener una buena exposición de los cóndilos. En algunos artículos se aconseja utilizar la guía del ligamento cruzado anterior para poder tener un ángulo de 10 a 15 grados eh, en el corte, hacer una fijación adecuada de las anclas y utilizar sutura reabsorbible e inclusive se puede utilizar una quinta ancla en el centro de la troclea para poder lograr que baje más eh, esta parte. Sin embargo, puede fallar y donde podemos tener problemas es que en hagamos en resecciones exageradas de hueso una mala angulación o que tengamos problemas al moldear el hueso osteocondral. Si es muy grueso, es difícil, inclusive puede llegar hasta fracturarse. La sutura puede llegar a cortar el cartílago o si tenemos una mala presa de las anclas. Todos estos factores quirúrgicos son importantes de tomar en cuenta en el momento de hacer este procedimiento. Que generalmente se coadyuvan, ya sea con una plastilla de partes blandas, un balance de partes blandas mediante el, la sustitución del ligamento patelofemoral o una osteotomía de la tuberosidad tibial cuando tenemos problemas de mala alineación distal del mecanismo extensor. Hay que inmovilizarlas por dos semanas, hacer un apoyo parcial con muletas a las dos semanas e iniciar la movilización activa y empezar con una fisioterapia alrededor de las cuatro semanas para poder recuperar los arcos de movilidad. Algunos resultados de los que están eh, descritos en la literatura, en este artículo publicado en el 2012, se ve que los pacientes, desde el punto de vista funcional, de acuerdo a la eh, valoración, tienen un resultado de regular a malo desde el punto de vista objetivo, sin embargo, la satisfacción subjetiva del paciente y la estabilidad subjetiva del paciente se obtiene pues, prácticamente en tres cuartas partes de los pacientes que se les hizo este resultado aislado. Hay una comparación, un estudio sistemático en donde eh, se hicieron de 459 eh, rodillas, 329 le hicieron trocloplastía y 130 nada más 
que hicieron algún otro procedimiento como realinación distal o plastía de ligamento patelo femoral distal, ambos tratamientos dieron buenos resultados, sin embargo, la troqueloplastía fue superior para evitar la reluxación y sobre todo para evitar el problema degenerativo articular secundario a esta inestabilidad crónica de los pacientes. También esta revisión sistemática publicada en 2016, en donde se buscaron 14 artículos donde incluían plastías de ligamento patelo femoral medial, osteotomía de la tuberosidad y, y trocloplastía. Todos, en todos los casos, con estas tres cirugías, los pacientes habían tenido una mejoría funcional, con fallas eh, funcionales hasta del 8.8%. Los procedimientos óseos se realizan principalmente en pacientes con displasia o con mala alineación distal. Hay más complicaciones en las osteotomías y debe ser un procedimiento combinado dependiendo de la anatomía personal del paciente. Esta técnica está indicada solo en displasias troclares graves, generalmente como coadyuvante a otros procedimientos como realineación proximal, plastía del ligamento patelo femoral medial o osteotomías de la tuberosidad tibial, como vimos en las pláticas. Es una técnica relativamente artesanal que tiene una curva de aprendizaje y que los resultados objetivos siempre son mejores, como en todos los problemas patelofemorales, que los objetivos. Sin embargo, puede no llegar a prevenir la osteoartrosis y se recomienda tener cautela al indicarla. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Rivera. Sin duda la trocleoplastía es un tema bastante interesante. Eh, vamos a iniciar con la ronda de, de preguntas y la discusión. I, I will try to summarize some of the audience questions for all the panelists. So, can I start uh, with you, Laurie? Or maybe this is an, an open question. Do, do any one of you use a SCAR to evaluate recurrence in these patients? to talk first about recurrence. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Use a, do, a score. Do you use a, a, a score, score for recurrence? Uh, not, no. I can, uh, okay. I can make some points well, to that. Um, yeah. I think in general, yeah, ahead, sure. can you hear me? Yep. In general, uh, after a first time dislocator uh, without a loose body, uh, you know, I think it's very prudent to do a risk stratification. So for me, I get MRIs uh, and then I look at many of the risk factors, you know, our colleagues talked about. Uh, you can use uh, Dr. Havisi's, uh, you know, RIP score is available online. So you could use that or some of our other colleagues uh, uh, risk factor scores. Um, and that will at least help to counsel patients uh, whether or not you might consider early soft tissue stabilization. But for me, that is still a very rare uh, thing to do uh, without a loose body in a first time dislocated. Okay, perfect. Dr. Sierra, I, I you talk with patients? I believe yep. that the scores are useful, uh, but just to have an idea of of who you're in front of, of who you're treating. Uh, if you have a first time dislocator probably it's, it's not a big deal if you do the score or not. If you have a multiple uh, dislocator, probably it's a good idea to take into account this kind of scores, just to take a look at what, what you're, you have in front and, and take a look at if you have a good anatomy, you know, a, a, I patient or a worst patient, what do you have in front? And then you can have the, the, the principal picture of that patient, know what's the, the uh, mean deformity, and then uh, you can plan better your, your surgery. You can give the patient a little more uh, chance to have a good result if you do this thing. So I think, uh, especially if we're, we're, talk, we're talking to residents, I think we, you should do that just to have a better idea of what, what you have in front of you. Okay, Dr. Rivera, any comments on, on this? Well, it's very important to know well the patient and to know what are the risk factors of, of the patient they have. 
So to decide what's the proper surgery that is indicated in, in yeah. Okay. There's a, a bunch of questions about trochloroplasty. So I want to ask Lori, how, how do you avoid all these uh, complications after trochloroplasty? So um, I've done a, about a hundred trochloroplasties now and I tend to, I've refined my criteria. So the patients that do the absolute best are actually the youngest patients. So I know many people are scared of trochloroplasty, so they don't want to do them on the young. So they then they do them on the older people, but they're all of mine that have had complications. So the younger the patient is, actually the better they do. And I use the same rehab protocol as a straightforward MPFL, and there are, some of them are actually day surgeries still now. So I think that the complications are choosing, to avoid complications, choose your patients very well. Uh, I think if you have any arthritis in the joint, it's a salvage procedure and you really have to temper your expectations and make sure the patient's expectations are appropriate. But in young people with, with, that have good tissue, it's a very nice operation with minimal complications. Okay. Do you use CPM, the post-op uh, rehab? No, so I do full range of motion immediately, full weight immediately. I put them in a hinged range of motion brace because I think their quadriceps shut down, but I see no reason to not let them move. The patella sits in the groove and actually reduces your trochleoplasty. Um, I use two little bioabsorbable tacks to fix my trochleoplasty. I don't use the tapes because we don't have access to those here. And that the, the little tacks that you use for osteochondral fractures and those work very, very well. And then I let them weight bear because it's, it's a, in the coronal plane. It doesn't matter for weight bearing. So I actually get them moving right away. Okay. Uh, what about you, Seth? How do you handle these patients? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's interesting just to point out in America, you know, trochleoplasty has not really, you know, caught on. Uh, we talk about the trochlea, and I think it's the main risk factor driving all of the discussion here but we are not very quick to do trochleoplasty. So I think we're still measuring everything and using it in revision settings, you know, first or second uh, revisions. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, oh, we're learning that some of our patients uh, are similar to the ones that Lori showed us where they have better alignment, you know, uh, with a TTO and a soft tissue but still have some subtle or persistent J sign and may not have uh, the good quality of life. So, um, you know, I think that I'm still in the mid to early learning curve of a deepening trochleoplasty. I agree completely with uh, the rat kneecap patients. Uh, it shouldn't be all, you know, just a small number. So you have to see a lot of patients and only time would be my thoughts on how to avoid complications. I think in Mexico and in all Latin America, probably this is a procedure that is very, uh, it's not being performed at all uh, just by few surgeons. Our, our, uh, our knowledge about it, it is a little bit uh, initial. I can say I, I, don't, I don't have much uh, uh, like, I, I I haven't performed a lot. I think it's there, but I think our our uh, curve has to be a little bit be better for us to have uh, better results. I'm not sure about how our, I think we have to take some time to see uh, how this procedure goes and and be able to. Uh, perform it the best way we can. I think it's not an easy procedure. We don't have the resources to do it still and do it in a good manner. So we're 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 starting with this thing, and and I think we have still a long way to go to do this procedure and have good results with it. May I make okay. one more quick comment? Yes. Um, so I think as I think about my indications for trochleoplasty and learning from people like Lori, I'm looking for these young patients with recurrent instability who have jumping J signs 
and maybe apprehension into deep reflection and they don't have very uh, large katan de champ, so I'm not thinking of doing both, uh, and they don't have major other risk factors. They might have the minor variants of the other risk factors. And so I know I'm not going to do well in PFL. It will fail, and I don't have another bony procedure that's better than what you and Richard are talking about, and that's where I would jump into trochleaplasty. I wonder if uh, the panelists who do this uh, would comment on those clinical. Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right, Seth. And don't get me wrong, I do, I do a lot of these, but I do 95% of the trochleoplasties in Canada. So I think you want uh, one or two wow. people in each area that are very good and see a lot of patients. As it's a technically difficult operation, and so the more you do, the better you get at it, and, and then you broaden your, your criteria. So I would do a trochleoplasty now on someone that I probably wouldn't have considered on five years ago, just because I've gotten better at it. So I totally agree with Seth. The other thing I would add with trochleoplasty is you need good tools. I, my example is we had a really old burr, and the burr is your main tool for re reducing the size of that osteochondral flap. And I got a new burr, and it, I, I injury to the cartilage and the heat injury is way reduced with good instruments. So I caution against doing this without good instruments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's the thing. Artilash, with, status is. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was telling you that we don't have good instruments to do this. That's a reality <laughs> not in America. I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Rivero, how, how do you evaluate the cartilage status after a trochoplasty? I mean, there's always important after this, uh, after removing all this subchondral bone, uh, what about the cartilage status uh, afterwards? Well, as Luis said, uh, this uh, uh, procedure that we perform very, uh, very little here in Mexico. We are just starting with it. And uh, it's imp only clinically we can say how is the, the, the wellness of the patient. We really don't have any kind of things to, to evaluate how is the cartilage chapter. Uh, Dr. Sierra. Uh, how much do you wait for doing surgery in this first time patellar dislocation? Dislocation. I mean, you, How you said you I... do you wait to do surgery do wait? In first time? Yep. Well, when I have a first time patellar dislocation, uh, which is rare, usually you get these people when they have two, three, four. I was telling. What I think, I, I think we have more, more abnorm, uh, uh, bone, bony abnormalities. I have a feeling that we have more people with bad anatomy. So when, when I have first time dislocator, what I do is I study, I study it. I don't like to operate on people when they're all swollen. I prefer just to wait a little bit, study them well. If I see they have a big osteochondral lesion and a bulging of the, of the uh, uh, medial patellofemoral ligament, well, you can operate on them, but I prefer to operate them when, when uh, one or two weeks have passed. And if, if they don't have those kind of big lesions, then you can just wait and study them well, see if they have big abnormalities, as Laurie was telling, uh, us see what's abnormal, uh, see what's the main, the the, the predominant deformity, and uh, do the do the the better surgery for that patient for the first time, and then you will you will have a better result on that patient. So I usually don't operate people on the first uh, dislocation. clear avulsion of, of the medial patellofemoral ligament and uh, if I have more abnormalities I prefer to wait and then go ahead and see what I have to do with all the things that we have to take care of with these patients. 
What about you, Seth? Um, I just wanted to actually ask um, if uh, you fix a osteochondral fragment, um, is the panel routinely also doing you know, soft tissue stabilization on the medial side of the joint? And then I was wondering, maybe we can get into the discussion after uh, a little about uh, the, Im the indication for the uh, medial plication or imbrication versus MPFL reconstruction, because I have some thoughts on that. But I guess the first one, uh, the osteochondral fragments uh, and fixing them, are you going to stabilize or not stabilize? Yeah. Actually, we have uh, that question, so if you want to answer. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you see some pros about medial reefing versus MPFL reconstructions? So, yes, yeah, so I can answer that. I guess we can go. Um, so if I'm fixing an osteochondral fragment, you know, cartilage or osteochondral, I'm going to do soft tissue stabilization for that patient. I will wait maybe a bit for the joint to calm down to reduce the risk of stiffness, but I'm not staging those. If that patient either typically um, has good tissue quality of the MPFL and no other bony abnormalities, I might consider just restoring that medial soft tissue sleeve. But I have to tell you, as I get better and better at MPFL reconstruction, I'm going more to reconstruction and not repair for those or other patients. Very nice. Uh, I agree. What? Sorry, if I could add, it, it's yes, interesting Laurie. because the MPFL imbrications gotten a bit of a bad rap, and I, I do them, but I do them now very rarely. Again, like Seth, as I got better and better at a reconstruction, it's not much more. But in definitely, if they have a high Baten score, I would not do an imbrication only, and they have to have normal anatomy. I don't usually do it acutely because I, unless you wait for that tissue to heal because the tissue is too ripped up to do it properly and then I'll do a reconstruction. But the failure rate for an imbrication, we published this, is 20%. It's probably better than your arthroscopic bank heart repair failure rate, but nobody, nobody gives the bad rap to the arthroscopic bank heart repair. So an imbrication is not a bad operation. And if patients have minimal instability or minimal laxity and good tissue and good anatomy, a little imbrication of that MPFL can be a very, very good operation that's actually very small with very quick recovery. So I, I think you shouldn't throw that baby out just because of a 20% failure rate. Many patients will accept that nicely. And I think if you that 20% failure rate was calculated with patients that shouldn't have had an imbrication. So if you choose your patients wisely, that failure rate's probably much lower. Okay. Uh, what, your type, thoughts, what, type Dr. Rivero? Use, what type of grab do you use for the MPFL reconstruction? The type of grab? I use a gracilis mainly. I use some allograft in, I've been trying allograft in my high baton patients, my very loose patients, but my go-to is a gracilis. I, I tend to use uh, allograft because it's readily available. There are obvious problems with cost. I worry about taking hamstrings in young loose jointed females uh, because of the neuromuscular abnormalities and it's also extra articular. So for me, allograft is a good uh, solution uh, uh, to the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, Laurie, you, you said you, you resolved the vast majority of these patients with MPFL reconstruction. And also, Dr. Sierra said he, we, we, are, we are overusing these MPFL reconstructions. What are your thoughts about this situation? So <laughs> My thought is uh, any patient who has instability needs an MPFL reconstruction and you add other procedures if necessary. So I think your MPFL reconstruction is your mainstay. That's how you stabilize. The other operations improve the biomechanics, they improve the anatomy, but they don't stabilize the patella. So to me, if you do an isolated TTO, like Seth says, I, I, I don't even think I do them anymore. I do them for pain or I do them for malalignment, but not for instability. 
Uh, I think the, the ones that are more stable after uh, just a TTO, I think someone just got lucky and they aligned them perfectly enough there and their muscles are good enough, they stay in. But I think all instability needs an MPFL soft tissue procedure, imbrication or reconstruction in addition. Yeah, to, to me, the uh, MPFL reconstruction is by far and away the workhorse of patella instability. Uh, and I um, will add bony procedures to that, but not instead of that. Um, one interesting point, which Dr. Sierra brought up, uh, I think when he did his bony realignments, then he did a plication to restore the resting length of the soft tissue. That's different than just doing it without correcting bony malalignment. And we need to study and report that group separately, in my opinion. So again, there may be a role with no abnormal malalignment or corrected malalignment for it, but not, um, you know, not in isolation. Um, and just to say it one more time, I think I saw it in translation. Uh, there is no role for isolated lateral release as a treatment option for patella instability. So uh, you can use lateral lengthening or release to get your patella centered before your MPFL, but not alone. So I think everybody got that, but uh, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I, Sarah. Yeah? Uh, I was telling that you were, we were abusing of uh, medial patellar femoral ligament reconstruction because of one thing. I think in Mexico, or probably in Latin America, we are using it for everything. Well, I've seen that. I've seen a lot of people use that patellar femoral ligament reconstructions and, and they just try to pull the patella and put it where it should be. And that's not good. I do a lot of uh, tibial osteotomies along with medial reefings and i think that's that's a very very nice procedure i i am not um satinizing uh medial patellofemoral ligament i am only saying that probably most of the surgeons don't have the ability to put in the femoral part when it, where it should be and i'm seeing a lot of uh, stiff joints because of bad uh, uh, technique of this procedure so it's a great procedure I, I i do it i do it but what i'm saying is it's good if you have a good anatomy and that's not always the case and when a patient doesn't have a good anatomy you have to do a lot of other things with the patellar femoral ligament but not the uh, reconstruction alone because that's what i see in mexico and that's what I, happens in Latin America probably. We don't study the patients. I see that a lot. So that's what I'm telling. I'm just saying that we don't have to do it alone, especially if we have bone deformities, which it happens a lot in, in Mexico. Yeah, I think the point yeah. is that you, the MPFL reconstruction is the workhorse in a reduced patella. Yeah. So the patella must be reduced in the groove. So whether you need a lot your of people GPL, doing just uh -huh. I think this is the this is what we have to teach is, is yeah. you can't you can't do a poor reconstruction with a bad tunnel and you can't use it if you're if it's not sitting reduced. One comment on the the regional variation, I think that's very, very true for Patellas. So when you talk to David Dejour uh, in France, they've been fixing every patella since the dawn of time. And you know, 100% of his patients have a family history and family members with patellar instability. I live in Canada where everybody is an immigrant. We've all come from all over the world. And I have a very different population than other places. So we have a lot of dysplasia here. 50% of my patients have high grade dysplasia. Um, we don't tend to have a lot of lateralized tubercles. So I do a tubercle osteotomy in maybe five to ten percent of my patients i actually do trochleoplasty i probably do 15 trochleoplasty a year so i think the regional okay. variation is very true with different racial groups yeah that's right dr rivero do you have any comment i just want to ask if you are just associate the uh, patellar femoral ligament reconstruction with uh, lateral release of the patella or without, or this is for set? 
Yeah, so um, I am always assessing uh, the tightness of the lateral retinaculum, the patella tilt, and the amount of glide from lateral to medial. Uh, I can also assess it arthroscopically. Uh, and in general, uh, if I feel that it's too tight laterally, I will cheat my incision more to the midline. That way I can do an open lateral lengthening at the same time as preparing my medial border of my MPFL. Um, I'm not typically doing arthroscopic lateral releasing uh, any uh, at all uh, in these procedures. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. We have a lot of questions about your tips and tricks in doing the MPFL reconstruction. What about you, Seth? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great point. Um, there are many different ways you can get it right. Um, I don't think you need to do all of them, but you need to do most of them. I think for me, at least, uh, I tend to use fluoroscopy initially, a large C-arm. I find Shottle's point, and that centers my incision over the femur. Then I dissect down from the patella to the femur. I can use an Alice clamp and pull up on that tissue and actually feel the MPFL origin. So I use anatomy that way. John Fulkerson makes a little bigger incision, finds the adductor tendon, and uses that as a landmark. So using anatomy, and then most importantly, for me after that is using the sutures from the patella down to a pin on the femur and checking isometry. And I want it to be either isometric or looser in flexion. And if I do two out of three of those or all three, then I think we can avoid harm. Okay. What about you, Laurie? Your trips? Yeah. I, I echo uh, Seth. I think the, the number one most important thing on an MPFL reconstruction is where you put the femoral tunnel. So again, it's, it's an area where that is located, where the MPFL inserts. And I think we have to be aware that with different anatomy, that insertion may be different in di different patients. So if you have high grade dysplasia, it might not be in the exact place. I do not use fluoroscopy. I'm not against it, but I think you can be fooled. I've seen people use fluoroscopy and the femurs rotated and they're like, look, I'm in the right spot. I'm like, but you're rotated. So fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy is great if you have perfect rotation on your, if you have a perfect lateral. Um, I palpate, I make a little incision. I feel adductor tubercle, I feel medial epicondyle, and then I stick my pin in, but I think the most important is checking those biomechanics. So uh, Corey Edgar did a study where he used fluoroscopy and he used palpation. And with both of them, 20% of the time, if you looked at the biomechanics, it still tightened in flexion and he had to adjust the pin. So I think both fluoroscopy and palpation and anatomy get you in the ballpark, but you must double check those biomechanics exactly like Seth said. Okay. Do, do you scope the knee after the MPFL reconstruction? I do. So I make sure the patella is centered. I'm not sure that that makes me feel good. So I can say good job, Lori, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure you will see subtle differences in tension on the graft or location from that, but you'll see the patella is centered. Another point, okay. uh, I would much rather be a little loose or too loose than too tight, yeah. uh, as Dr. Sierra alluded to. So um, you can either fix it in a little deeper flexion, that's you know fine. Um, uh, but you want to make sure you have a good check rein. Uh, if your pin, uh, if you're too tight on your isometry testing, the move is to move the pin distal and posterior in most cases to get a little more favorable isometry. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Sierra. Uh, I agree with them, with uh, Laurie and Sev. I usually use a gracilis tendon also. I uh, fix it with anchors in the patella with two suture anchors, not uh, screwed in, but I use suture, made out of suture. And I just put the tendon by the side of the patella. 
and then I do I do an incision there, and then I do an incision uh, between the epicondyle and the adductor uh, insertion. I just palpate it, and I put just to stay said I put my pin in there, and then I kind of wrap I. I pull, I pull the sutures down and then I just wrap the tendon around the pin and I take a look at how it moves. It, it's, if it's too tight in flexion, I tend to move it distally and posteriorly. And that way you can uh, uh, assure that, that you are going to have uh, a patellofemoral ligament that's not too tight in tension, which, which I think it's what happens in most of the time. So. That's how I do it. I don't use fluoroscopy. I just do it anatomically, like like they do. What about you, Doctor Rivero? Just the Your same tips. as Luis. I check the isometry, but I do use uh, X-rays to be sure that I'm in the right point. Okay. I I have uh, a question. Uh, in distal dislocators, like in 40 to 60 degrees, do you think it's a, a proper indication for trochoplasty, Lori? So, um, I, so I think that's one of the indications. So, so like I said, you have to take everything into consideration. And this is sometimes why, you know, I'm at a meeting and people quick show me an x-ray or show me a CT scan and say, what would you do? And I can never tell them because I, I, I've seen trochlea that look terrible and I'm like, ooh, that looks like a trochleoplasty. And you go in and the patient's functioning well, they're doing great, they're playing uh, college basketball, they've dislocated a couple times and they don't have a big J sign. Well, I'm not going to do a trochleoplasty in them. So... I'm always uh, humbled when I go in and talk to the patient. That's, I actually have to look them in the eyes and, and see how disabled and see what the J sign is like. So my algorithm works to sort out the, the bony anatomy, but then you have to add the, the physical exam and the patient characteristics in there too. So I, I can, I'll never answer that question on one, one piece of information because I think you need to put it all together. And I actually think you need to look sure. someone in the eyes. <laughs> I completely agree. Uh, I think if you're talking about someone who continues to dislocate into flexion, um, then you're thinking about uh, patella alta as one potential cause. Uh, obviously, you know, you're thinking about trochlear dysplasia as well. Those patients dislocated in extension, but also flexion, right? That's different than a flexion dislocator, which is a different animal. Uh, and that has more to do with some soft tissue contractures, sometimes of the quad, and may need to have lengthenings of the soft tissues. So teasing those two groups out uh, is very important. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Rivero, go ahead. Trochloplasty can prevent osteoarthritis of the patellofemoral joint. Lori, I want to know that too. <laughs> oh yeah, great! Why did you put on the spot? <laughs> um, I actually think that's an, that's an awesome question. Um, we know who does patellofemoral arthroplasty. Not me. Not me. <laughs> so we know that patients with high grade dysplasia go on to patellofemoral OA. We also know that patellofemoral dislocators have a higher rate of patellofemoral way down the road. So, and you have all seen patients who are 45 who have high grade dysplasia but never got fixed that now have end stage away. So if you take a 15 year old who has high grade dysplasia and is a dislocator and you give them a new trochlea and you stabilize them and you redistribute the forces in the patellofemoral joint, I think you change the natural history. That'll be very difficult to prove, but how, like, if we know they're gonna have arthritis, this is partly why I, I don't quite understand why people are so afraid of trochleoplasty. Um, you need to come visit me and see some, because you won't be so scared of it. But um, 
we know those patients are doomed to have arthritis. They're unstable and they have high grade dysplasia. So yes, there's a risk to the cartilage if you don't have good surgical technique, but we know they're gonna get arthritis anyways. So all those studies that may show a little bit of arthritis post-trochleoplasty, those patients were going to get that anyways. That's not new arthritis per se. So I think it's a. I think you change the natural history if you do it in the right person at the right time. I won't hold you to this. It's not like they're recording <laughs> this or anything. But uh, <laughs> do you think that uh, trochleoplasty has any role in the refractory, miserable patellofemoral pain, pain patient with severe pain. dysplasia that's failed <laughs> everything? That's not I, unstable. I, I've done it. So don't hold me to that. I've done it and they're happy <laughs> and the pig in the proverbial. Like they are, it's, it's picking your patients. And again, every patient is different and every patellofemoral pain with dysplasia, I'm not going to do a trochleoplasty. But I just like rota tibial external rotation is a big cause of patellofemoral pain. And I've derotated tibias for pain and I've done trochleoplasties for pain. Not many, but but I, I do think it has a role if we could figure out who the right people were. Okay. okay. Awesome. <laughs> you I don't know if you have <laughs> any question to each other. Any doubts from your lectures? <laughs> My Spanish was a bit rusty. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sierra, no, would you I, like to? I think we have to ask something. The most important things we we wanted to tell, probably the ones who are on the other side. Uh, I just want to say that we have to study the patients well. I see a lot of revision surgeries in which clearly the patient wasn't studied well, and uh, I think we can all agree that these are very good uh, tools that, that we have already to, to study them and, and do a better surgery on the first time for them. And that's, I think uh, we touched all the points that we uh, wanted to, and I'm happy with that. I don't have, I don't have uh, more comments about that. Okay. So I, I think we are on time. So just to end up with this great round of questions and discussion, the last question will be, what's, what's your, your advice to all the residents and fellows who will be starting their own practice soon? Uh, I, I would just uh, say thank you, first off, for having me as part of this. It's very special. Uh, we love to teach and learn, and that's why our job is really fun. And so even in this pandemic, opportunities like this, uh, you know, kind of get us up on Monday morning. So I think that finding something you love to do that drives you um, is, is very important for your career and your future. Um, you know, I think uh, within patellofemoral and within the joint preservation and cartilage world, we are a very tight-knit group. We all actually like each other. We all want to learn from each other. And we frankly are available to the young people. Uh, I, all the people that I had pictures of uh, on there, you know, took me in as a young kid uh, and helped bring me into this field. And so <laughs> I think we're all open to doing that for anyone who shows an interest. Um, uh, and so we welcome you to get involved, I think would be my take home. Very nice. Laurie? Uh, well, thank you also for having me. <laughs> um, I think uh, know, know what you know and know what you don't know. And I, I think if, if you take that to heart, I think people get all, all worked up, like back pain, get worked up about the patellofemoral joint and try to think of it logically. What's wrong? How can I fix it? Am I fixing it at the right spot? And and don't don't get overwhelmed with all the detail because if you see all the detail, you you can't find the pathway, and it, it's not as confusing as you think. But but know what you know and know what you don't know, and don't tackle things that you don't know how to do. But realize that the most of the ones you see are fairly straightforward, and don't be afraid to ask for help. 
Good. Doctor Sierra. Well, I'm going to say in, in Spanish. Eh, Adelante. Para todos los residentes que nos, que nos escuchan, primero gracias por su atención, gracias por estar aquí. Los problemas patelofemorales son probablemente las, de las cosas más difíciles que hacemos en medicina deportiva. Eh, creo que un problema patelofemoral es al, al paciente al que más tenemos que ponerle atención en el sentido de tengo que entender su historia, tengo que conectar con él, tengo que saber qué problema tiene principalmente, si es dolor, si es inestabilidad o si son las dos. Tengo que explorarlo muy bien para ver cuándo se luxa, cómo se luxa. Tengo que entender sus tejidos blandos, tengo que entender su anatomía ósea. Tengo que intuir qué, cuál es el problema más grave que tiene. No puedo hacer 10 cirugías en una rodilla, porque a veces también lo veo. Entonces, sé con sus radiólogos, hagan tomografías o resonancias que les sepan sacar el, el mucho y se los digo a mis residentes, acérquense con sus radiólogos y díganles que necesitan esto y superponer las imágenes y medirle de aquí para acá para medir el TTTG y el TTPCL. Eso es algo que es súper importante porque tiene más deformidades graves. Al menos es la impresión que yo tengo, no la puedo medir. Pero creo que si evaluamos muy bien estar cayendo en reoperaciones y reoperaciones y reoperaciones, veo mucho... Le liberé y le apliqué, es todo, ¿sí? Entonces tenemos que ir más allá. Y creo que con este eh, grupo, eh, especialmente con, con este grupo de, de personas que tenemos aquí, creo que fue un gran eh, webinar y creo que nos pueden dar un panorama general para tratar de hacer las cosas un poquito diferentes y tratar de mejorar a nuestros pacientes. Muchísimas gracias. And thank you, Laurie. Thank you, uh, Seth. Gracias, eh, Chava. Por, por compartir esto con usted, con, conmigo. Les agradezco mucho y gracias, Jaime, por la invitación. Doctor Rivero, terminamos eh, con usted. Bueno, well, en el nombre del Colegio Mexicano de Ortopedia, we want to thank very much uh, Lori and Seth. They gave us a great talks and they gave us a great experience and we are sure that we're going to capitalize it, it for our good. Y a todos los que nos asistieron, a todos los que estuvieron con nosotros, pues queremos darles las gracias en nombre del Colegio Mexicano de Ortopedia por habernos acompañado y para que sigan trabajando con nosotros, siendo líderes de la Ortopedia Nacional. Gracias a ti también, Jaime, por organizar y por poner tu tiempo. Y Luis, pues estuvo fantástico con sus pláticas. ¿eh? Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias a todos ustedes. También agradecer al staff del CMO, a Janet, a Fernanda, a Jessica, to all the panelists. Thank you so much, Laurie, Seth. It's been a pleasure. Doctor Sierra y Doctor Rivero, muchísimas gracias por su participación. Y gracias a toda la audiencia por participar también. Thank you so much. Buenas noches. Adiós, amigos. Adiós, amigos. See you soon. <laughs>